In this video, we're going to talk about coronary artery disease. It's kind of a catch-all term for a few things that can go wrong with the heart. The two big ones that I want to talk about are angina and myocardial infarction. Now, angina, some people pronounce it angina, um, it's a little bit milder, but it's a warning sign that a myocardial infarction may be coming. And because they both present with similar signs and symptoms, we kind of clump them together. And until we get the patient to the hospital, it's really hard to differentiate between the two. But we'll give you a couple of, of things to look for to maybe um, give you hints on which it could be. So with coronary artery disease, there are two kind of concepts here we need to understand. One is arteriosclerosis. And this is usually the thickening and hardening of the small arteries in the body, so we call it hardening of the arteries. And a version of that is atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is the buildup of fatty deposits inside the uh, arteries, and if it happens in the coronary arteries, we call it um, coronary artery disease. Uh, but it can happen in, in blood vessels throughout the body. Uh, so what happens with this is your blood vessels the innermost lining becomes damaged, and this could be due to things like diabetes, high blood pressure, exercise, lack of exercise, smoking, um, low high density lipoprotein cholesterol, low HDL, or high LDL, all can cause damage. And then the inflammatory response kicks in and starts to try to protect it. It almost looks like it's a um, damage or like a cut to one of the blood vessels. So the immune system, not the immune system, the um, <coughs> clotting factors and platelets begin to come to the area and try to um, to wall it off. And initially we have um, fat laid down and then that can be covered up with some calcium deposits and that becomes a plaque. And when that plaque gets ruptured, that's when we uh, begin to have a clot buildup in the area, so a thrombus. So if we look at a coronary artery, hopefully your arteries right now are nice and clear and open and everything's flowing like it's supposed to and you eat a, a little bit of, um, of fatty stuff over your lifetime and begin to have a little bit of a buildup of, of fat in there and then as we go on that becomes much much bigger and begins to, to block it off. Now if that gets damaged, um, ruptures or the plaque tears, the body uh, will begin to think of this as like a cut in the skin and wants to form a clot there. And when that happens, that's when we'll have a thrombus build up and we have complete blockage at that point and the um, artery is no longer flowing any blood. And when that happens, then part of the heart muscle will die. So before we get to a true myocardial infarction, will have usually some warning signs. And so angina is kind of like a warning sign of, of something bad is about to happen. So with angina, I'm gonna back up a slide. With angina or angina, we're probably more in this phase here where it's mostly blocked, but we haven't quite gotten to that phase where it's completely blocked yet. Then remember when it's completely blocked, that part of the heart will die. So with angina or angina, um, we will begin to have some chest pain, and it's usually in the center of the chest, or what we call substernal. And it's in the same place for myocardial infarction. However, the MI pain is usually much more intense and much more severe than the angina pain is. Uh, but most of the time, they'll describe it as a dull, heavy pressure, squeezing, tightness, somebody sitting on their chest, something like that. Now with angina, the blood vessel is still partially open, so some of the blood is getting through, but when a person does something that um, is very stressful or they exercise or they go out to mow the yard or they go for a walk um, or en engage in some physical activity, then their heart starts to beat harder and faster and needs more oxygen itself. But now that partially blocked artery can't supply enough oxygen and the heart begins to um, become ischemic and then may even eventually infarct, but that's what causes the chest pain. However, when they sit down and rest, it usually will go away. So that's what would palliate or something that'll make it better, sitting down and resting. Where somebody having a myocardial infarction, um, if they sit down and rest with an MI, the artery is completely blocked. And so now even sitting down and resting versus exercising makes no difference. And the pain um, won't go away when they sit down and rest. Um, MIs are generally feel just worse to the patient. So expect them to look kind of sweaty or clammy, um, gray or pale, 
um, there's a certain gray look that you'll you recognize uh, once you see it. You go, oh, yep, that's an MI. A lot of times they've vomited or been real sick to their stomach. They feel weak and, and tired and dizzy and lightheaded. And there's this impending feeling of doom. They just feel like something's wrong, feel like they're going to die. So with angina, again, it usually happens when they exert themselves, but with an MI, because that thrombus formed, that clot formed, <clears throat> it could happen at any time. So it could happen when they're sitting down watching television. It could happen when they're out mowing the yard. Um, it could even happen in their sleep. And I had a physician once tell me that if chest pain ever woke them up at night, that it's probably a, probably a heart attack um, or an MI. Uh, MI is the, or myocardial infarction, is the medical term for what we call a heart attack. Um, angina is usually just kind of a buildup or a warning that that's about to happen. So with angina, uh, when they sit down and rest, um, the pain will usually go away in about 10 to 15 minutes. If they take one of their nitroglycerin um, tablets, if they've been prescribed that, that may help and the pain will go away with that. Where normally with an MI, it doesn't. So regardless of um, whether we think the patient is having angina or having an MI, we're going to treat it about the same. And it's something that is very um, critical. Um, very serious. This would be not necessarily an unstable patient, but it's one that needs to get to the hospital very quickly because they have procedures that they can do to go in there and either break up the clot or pull the clot out or run a catheter through the clot and then expand it so they can restore blood flow. Those are all um, versions of stents or, or they're going to get a stent put in, but they have to go in there and break the clot up or pull the clot out first. Um, if that is not an option, then they have to do bypass. But the longer it takes for them to get um, medical care at a hospital, the more the heart could be dying. So we say time is muscle, and we want to get over to the hospital as quickly as comfortable, or as quickly as possible. We're going to put them in a position of comfort, and if they are not allergic to it and have not had an aspirin that day, we're going to give them a 160 to 325 milligrams of aspirin, and that's something that we need to do right away. Um, that will stop the platelets from sticking together. It's kind of a easy way to, to think about what's happening there. So the clot or the thrombus is not going to get any larger. Now the oxygen, a um, little controversial now. Uh, well, maybe not controversial, but make sure we use it properly. We want to make sure we have an oxygen saturation of 94 to 99%. If it's 94 to 99, we don't need to give them oxygen. It can actually make the MI much larger if we do give them oxygen. If um, their oxygen saturation is below 94, start low, nasal cannula, one to two liters, and kind of bump up until we get that oxygen saturation to 94 to 99%. Now, if they have a prescription for nitroglycerin, we can assist them with that. So they can have one every three to five minutes as long as their blood pressure remains adequate, which we usually say is blood pressure, systolic blood pressure of at least 100, and they don't have any other contraindications to taking it. And this is one of those that we want to load them in the ambulance pretty quickly and get going towards a cardiac center or hospital that has cardiac care has a cath lab, and in the meantime, um, if you're not with an ALS unit, you want to intercept with one if you can, so they can draw blood, start the IV, and most importantly, do the 12 lead ECG and transmit it ahead to the hospital so the hospital can be prepared. There's a couple of special things I want to mention with coronary artery disease and with MIs. Um, one is something called Levine's sign, and Levine's sign is when the person will take their clenched fist and hold it to their chest. And this is something that we see probably males do more than females, but if they're holding their chest like this, clenching their, their um, fist to their chest, um, it usually indicates that they're having an MI. It's just something that they do kind of kind of naturally. Um, the other thing I want to mention is uh, the abnormal or silent type of MIs. So women seem to, though there's a little bit of data that still this maybe isn't true now, but we still think that women tend to present with vaguer signs of an MI, so they may not have the crushing chest pain and um, diabetics and the elderly just don't feel pain as intensely so they may not have pain with their MIs either so they may have something called a silent MI and they will still have some nausea some shortness of breath maybe look a little pale and sweaty um, and just tired um, but just may not have that that heavy chest pain so they may not be thinking that they're having an MI so when we have a an older or a female or a diabetic that has kind of vague signs um, you need to be thinking about the possibility of an MI with them and uh, get uh, en route to a hospital, cardiac hospital, and get ALS intercepts so we can get the 12 lead. So just a little bit of a difference between angina 
angina and a myocardial infarction. Um, I hope that helps you study and I hope you do well in your tests.